So my lab's based at the LMCB, as you've heard, and uh, the reason I'm part of uh, ICH is because I joined the Department of Pediatrics, which later became part um, of ICH, but that was after I'd moved my lab to the LMCB. So what I'm going to do uh, today is to tell you a little bit about the research I've been involved in over the years and some contributions to UCL life and offer a few reflections uh, along the way. So first of all, why am I here? Why am I a scientist if I got scientific genes? Well, my mother was certainly extremely organised and liked lists, which I do. Her handwriting was much neater than mine, though. But I rather suspect my uh, genes came from my father, um, who, although he left school at 16, he went to work in a lab and uh, later, uh, sort of through uh, studying at night, achieved a first-class degree in metallurgy. So not quite my field, but uh, I, say I expect that's where a lot of the, sort of the scientific thinking came from. But I knew that I actually was really interested in science, and particularly biomedical science, even at primary school. Um, I remember um, some television programs that we used to watch uh, as a class. We used to troop into the hall and sit on the floor and watch them. Uh, one of them was called Meeting Our Needs. And I found this um, uh, for using Google, of course, where else? Um, and it's described as uh, offering programs of uh, integrated studies in history, science and geography, aimed at increasing awareness of man's inventiveness. I don't remember much about the geography part, but I do remember the science and the history because there was one particular series that had a real focus on the history of medicine uh, that I remember being very interested in. And I'll come back to man's inventiveness later. Um, so I went to uh, grammar school and again just chose to follow and do the subjects uh, that I was most interested in and that eventually led me to do uh, study biology, chemistry and maths for A level. Um, interestingly I was discouraged from doing physics. Um, I think that possibly would have been more useful than the maths um, but I did really enjoy the maths anyway. And then as you've heard I went to university and read natural sciences and in my third year majored in biochemistry. So after that, uh, I joined uh, David Lane's lab at, uh, for my PhD at Imperial College and then stayed with him um, uh, as a postdoc when he moved his lab uh, to the Clare Hall Labs uh, and joined Imperial Cancer Research Fund, uh, now known as Cancer Research UK. And then after that, I uh, did a second postdoc in Cambridge with Bruce Ponder. And I've clearly got a good... Uh, sense of uh, uh, excellence in that both these, my supervisors later became knighted. Uh, nothing to do with the work I did for them at all. And then as you've heard, I joined UCL in 1992 in the department of uh, Professor Mark Gardner, who's unfortunately in Crete, so he couldn't be here today. So if I look at the work that I did before I arrived at UCL, uh, I can summarise that probably with three words, uh, disease, models and genes. And sort of in that um, nine years, I moved from having a molecular biology focus to molecular genetics. So this is the first paper that I ever published. Um, working with David, we were uh, in the cancer field and using SV40 virus uh, to try and understand cancer. It was an oncogenic virus and using it as a model, a simple model. And then later, still in the cancer uh, field, uh, I worked uh, on trying to identify the gene that caused multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2A, uh, which uh, we were successful with. It took many years. Uh, these uh, two papers here I show uh, simply because they're back-to-back -back papers, but the first author of this paper, Emily Gardner, uh, very recently has joined uh, to work part-time for me. So it's a really small world, isn't it? So let's move on to Batten disease then. So as you've heard, um, it's also uh, the group is a family of diseases, a group and known as the neuronal ceroid lipofusionoses, and I'll either refer to it as Batten disease or NCL. The families, of course, prefer the name Batten disease and tend to use that name now for, to describe all types of the disease. The name came from uh, this physician, uh, Frederick Batten, who was uh, at Great Ormond Street Hospital and then moved to the National Hospital for the Paralysed and Epileptic in Queen Square, which of course um, is now part of um, UCL. 
and in 1903 he described two sisters with the condition. Uh, it wasn't the first description, that was in 1826, but that was in Norwegian, so it certainly passed a lot of people by at the time. As I was trying to decide on the title for this lecture, um, I looked up the, uh, what baton meant, and it comes from an old French word meaning to beat, but it's beat with a stick rather than fight in battle, although I think both meanings are appropriate for baton disease. So let me explain a little bit about what baton disease is like. Uh, this is examples of two types of baton disease. Um, so CLN1 disease is one of the earlier onset types. Um, as you've heard, it's a devastating disease. Um, so this little girl is apparently perfectly healthy at age one, doing what one-year-olds do, standing up uh, on her own, smiling. But six months later, as the, the disease has kicked in, she's lost, she can't balance on her own anymore, uh, she can't smile anymore, and a couple of years later, she really is very severely affected, and uh, she would have died uh, before the age of 10. And the disease is caused by massive loss of cells within the brain so that the brain shrinks down and gradually the children who are affected lose a lot of the uh, exact abilities um, that they would have normally. So they go blind, they suffer from seizures, uh, they um, can't uh, lose the ability to move terribly well, uh, swallowing, they lose their speech, really is a horrible disease. CLN3 disease is... Um, the most common type uh, in the world. Um, there are around uh, five new cases diagnosed in the UK each year. Altogether, NCLs are about 10 new cases a year uh, in the UK. So this um, disease starts a little bit later. Usually, as children are just starting school, they suffer from some visual problems and they go blind uh, relatively rapidly within a couple of years. Uh, so here's Laura with um, her white stick with her mum, and Laura's now 16. Uh, the disease progresses and uh, usually by the teenage years, again, very severely affected. And uh, those who have this type of uh, juvenile CLN3 disease would survive up until their late 20s, um, possibly early 30s. So baton disease as a whole is a, a part of a group of diseases called storage diseases because material is accumulating within the cells. And for baton disease in particular, this material is autofluorescent. And you can see that here with these bright uh, autofluorescent particles within the cell. And if we use an electron microscope to look at these in more detail, um, this is what uh, this looks like for the CLN3 disease that I showed you before. It looks a little bit like a fingerprint. Uh, this is the storage within the cell, and we actually call these fingerprint profiles, and these kind of uh, deposits are characteristic for Batten disease uh, and have been used uh, diagnostically. We know the storage occurs uh, within uh, lysosomes, within cells. These are the parts of the cells that are involved in recycling components that the cell doesn't need anymore. And so clearly part of the biology or the mechanism underlying the disease is a problem with recycling. So why study Batten disease? Uh, it is very rare, as I've said. Obviously, trying to understand more about this disease helps us understand more about uh, healthy cells, understand pathways, uh, the biology of pathways within the cell, uh, and perhaps highlights things we might not have found out about otherwise. Um, and of course, uh, we hope that through studying and understanding more about Batten disease, and this is, of course, is what the families want, that perhaps there'll be uh, an opportunity to prevent uh, the disease um, occurring at all, or certainly making it not as bad as it is. So, obviously, I've spent my uh, uh, career working on genetic disease, so I wondered... You know, what, what, what's it like working on a genetic disease? And for me, I do like doing jigsaws. Um, and it's like doing a jigsaw, but without having the picture on the lid. So you've no idea what the final picture is going to be like. So here's just to show you what it's like. Uh, see whether you can guess what this um, picture is as some of the, I hope, uh, parts of the picture emerge. It's probably a painting most of you have seen before. Yeah, I can see some recognition there. There was actually a programme on television this week about it, wasn't there, if any of you caught it. 
So this, of course, is the Mears, the girl with the pearl earring. And it's only when you start seeing some sort of characteristic features, this blue hairband or perhaps the pearl earring, that you really get to a sense that, oh, I think I recognise that. Uh, but, of course, you only see the full picture uh, when, you, when, when, it's, when it's there. And to me, that's what uh, working on a disease like Batten disease is. Uh, we haven't yet got the full picture. Um, and, but things are emerging, and one day we will have. So my research strategy, uh, I've been here a long time, has actually not changed, uh, and this is it. Uh, it was to understand the disease. Uh, we knew the disease was an inherited disease, to, so to identify the genes that cause the disease, and then to understand um, about the function and the areas of biology that those genes contributed to, and using all that information to uh, lead to therapy. Uh, along the way, we... Um, I've used models, different model systems, and identified mutations, and that all gives extra information. And, but always hoping that maybe there'd be something that came up that allowed us to do a fast route towards therapy. So I'm going to talk to you about the different areas uh, of that work as we go along. So first of all, sort of the quite long area of genes, and you'll recognise some of the people on here, I think. Um, so I hope I've got all the names listed at the bottom. Uh, Jamie and Trasser were my first uh, PhD students, and they're here. Uh, Wayne as well. Uh, I know he was hoping to be here, but I'm not quite sure whether he made it. Um, here's Hannah up here, and a few more, and down here, and there's Nick Green here. This is Mark Gardner, who uh, was head of the department. Um, of course, whereas it's the, the Batten disease is rare and the international community who work on Batten disease get together every two years. Uh, so this is a photograph taken uh, in Finland and this is Ruth Williams who was at GOSH but is now a paediatric neurologist at Evelina Children's Hospital. And here we are again at an international meeting in Dallas but I can't remember whether that was before or after the line dancing that we had to go with. <laughs> So, a little bit about uh, this work. So, this is a really old slide that I made many years ago, uh, just to try and explain uh, what inherited disease is like. So, our genes are contained on chromosomes, uh, and we generally have pairs of chromosomes that are inherited from both of our parents. And uh, a child with Batten disease has inherited... Um, two copies of the same gene, but neither of them are working. There's mutations uh, within those genes, and they've inherited one of those chromosomes from the father and one from the mother. And because that gene isn't working, the disease occurs. Um, other children might uh, have inherited completely uh, healthy copies of the chromosomes that were, or again, may have inherited one of the mutations, but just on one of the chromosomes, so they're as healthy as their parents are. Um, and this type of inheritance is called autosomal recessive inheritance. So as part of uh, our, the early work, we were trying to sort of identify the genes. So first of all, to map the genes, to find out uh, on which chromosome the disease genes were located, and then to identify the genes and then find the mutation in the DNA on that gene. And that's, this is very like trying to find a spelling mistake in a book. So first of all, you perhaps will find, try and think about finding the chapter that the mutation is in, and then the... Um, uh, find the page that the sentence is in, and then eventually you hone down on that single uh, spelling mistake. And that's really what it was. And here's a picture of uh, myself and Patsy. UCL were doing um, uh, some kind of article for a magazine, so they did quite an arty photograph of us. And uh, Patricia Munro has been a professor for many years now. And this is some very early uh, summary of some of the work. Um, we discovered that the gene was on chromosome 16 and it was on the short arm of chromosome 16, just above the centre of the chromosome. And we knew, this is a lot of work by Hannah Mitchison, we knew that the gene was between these two markers, which you can see in red here. And uh, we later found out that, in fact, one of the markers here, the 16S298, was actually contained within the CLN3 gene. So we reported identification of the CLN3 gene in 1995, um, and this was uh, one of the first uh, reports of a Batten disease gene. A hallmark of my uh, science has been a lot of collaboration, and even this um, first paper here was the work of uh, an international consortium, five different labs, 
uh, two from the States, one from Australia, one from the Netherlands, who were all interested in trying to find out about Sea Lane 3, and we decided to work together. And over the years, uh, more genes have been discovered. Um, the ones at the beginning took many years to identify using fa many families. Uh, this was before the human genome had been sequenced, so we were tra trying to sequence genes as we went along. Uh, but those, sort of, oops, those that have been described more recently, um, the work has been done just in single families, um, and of course the work can be done in uh, several months or even less than a month uh, if you added up the, thing, added up the time. So that's uh, the effect of changing technologies on this research. Um, I started to gather the uh, mutations that were being reported uh, uh, because that was helpful to us as a lab and eventually thought, and thought this was probably useful to others. So, so this is the establishment of the NCL mutation database here. And this now has more than 440 mutations in it, uh, with, which are, come from pe more than uh, 1,400 patients. Not all the patients in the world by any mean. Uh, now we're just gathering the, sort of the new mutations that are reported. And they, uh, the data is freely accessible to anyone. They can download the tables uh, and sort uh, against country of residence or ethnicity, which can be a real help for countries who are trying to do some diagnosis to know which are the most common mutations uh, in their uh, country. And I later expanded this database up into this website called NCL Resource to provide a gateway for Batten disease for people who were coming into contact with Batten disease for the first time, whether families or a clinician who was finding that they were caring for a, a, patient, a family and, of course, they'd never met Batten disease before. And the idea is that there is accurate information there uh, and it points them to where they can find more information. There were a few surprises along the way. So, for example, CLN6, we discovered the gene in 2002 uh, uh, using a number of families, but these two families were particularly helpful. And then nine years later, I was part of um, an, uh, sort of this rare disease consortium which was focusing on uh, adult NCL, uh, Cuff's, which is also called Cuff's disease, and we were trying to identify the genes within, that caused adult onset NCL. Uh, and we did some work together, again, uh, uh, labs from around the world. Uh, and I remember the conversation with Sam Berkovich from Australia, who was leading this work. Uh, he made sure I was sitting down when he phoned me up to tell me. And it turned out that the group of um, uh, families with Cuff's disease also had mutations in CLN6. So this was unexpected. Um, for that particular group. They all, the families all had different mutations. Um, so that was really uh, interesting at the time. And actually, this has turned out to be the case for many of the Batten disease genes, which are, are listed down here. Uh, what we know now is that there's, uh, we know the typical disease that arises from complete loss of function, of complete, uh, where the gene isn't working at all, but there's also uh, other diseases uh, um, or less severe disease, or rather the, the milder mutations lead to disease that either has a later age of onset or has a much more progressive uh, or um, slower course of the disease or even quite a different disease. And uh, we predicted a few years ago that perhaps for CLN3 disease, maybe there would be people affected who were only blind. And that's been reported very recently where there are now adult patients uh, who are going blind in adulthood, and it turns out the genetic cause of their disease is, CLN, is a mutation in CLN3. So this complexity of, uh, Batten, within Batten disease has led um, to us proposing a new classification and nomenclature. Previously, the disease was described according to the age of onset of the uh, disease, but now uh, we, again, getting together with the international um, uh, uh, clinicians decided to propose a nomenclature that was gene-based and uh, Ruth Williams and I uh, wrote this up and uh, also audited against the families that she sees at Evelina Children's Hospital to make sure that this nomenclature works and this is now mostly the nomenclature that, that is used in the literature. So now I'll move on to the uh, function uh, biology part of, of my work. Unfortunately, we know less about this uh, than we do about the genes. Uh, we still don't fully understand everything uh, about um, 
uh, what these genes do. Uh, here are some pictures of different people who've contributed. Uh, Sandra started the yeast work. Um, this is the uh, lab from a couple of years ago. Uh, they're dressed up as Game of Thrones characters uh, because we have a monthly cocktail with a theme and that was the theme that we chose. Uh, and this is the current lab uh, now. So, here's a very simple diagram of a cell, one that I've used again for a long time. Um, it's perhaps not a surprise because we know there's a problem with recycling uh, within the cell that many of the genes encode proteins, enzymes within the lysosome or membrane proteins of the lysosome, the organelle that's involved in the recycling. Um, these enzymes are to do with degrading the different components within uh, the cell that are being recycled and although we don't fully know what the function of these membrane proteins are, they're probably something to do with keeping the environment of the lysosome um, uh, as it should be, so making sure the pH is right or the, the ionic composition, etc. But we also see uh, a group of genes that are located, or the proteins that they encode are located elsewhere in the cell, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi. And uh, this is the uh, part of the cell that makes the proteins that traffic to the lysosome, so it could be a connection with that. But it's also, um, the, there are many lysosomes within the cell, which you can see here are, as these red dots, they're scattered right through the cell. And there's also the endoplasmic reticulum, which you can see in green, is also a big network throughout the cell. And there are junctions between the lysosomes and ER. So it may be that actually the function that they're doing is something to do sort of a direct connection with the lysosome. We will find out at some point, I'm sure. So I mentioned that we worked on some of the mod different models, and here's a picture of some of them. So from very simple models, the uh, yeasts, to nematode worms and slime molds, through to uh, Drosophila fly, which has got, as you can see, has got an eye and a very simple brain, and then vertebrates, uh, mouse, dogs, monkeys, sheep, and zebrafish. Uh, the sheep and the monkeys and the dogs and indeed some of the mice get bad disease naturally. Uh, so we're uh, just able to study uh, what's there. But, some of the, but also mice and fish and also these uh, uh, lower organisms we can engineer and obviously uh, make them have bad disease so we can study them. And the ones I've been particularly involved in are boxed in uh, red here. So yeast. Why yeast? It doesn't seem the most obvious model to use when you're looking at a brain disease uh, because obviously yeast don't have brains. But this is a poster that was drawn by two people called Two Visual Thinkers at the um, Batten Disease Family Association Conference last year. They were listening to all the talks that the scientists gave uh, and summarising them in poster form and they've summarised it so well I thought I'd just give you uh, a picture of this. So here we are, that's me there, working on uh, yeast um, it's simple, it's single cell, it's only got 5,000 genes rather than the sort of uh, more than 20,000 that we have, so we can think about it in a simpler way. We know that the yeast uh, get bats and disease and we, uh, it, that the gene is functioning in the same way because we can put the human gene back in there and it rescues and, and makes the yeast healthy again. And uh, so our bi the biology is very similar uh, to our biology. Uh, and we've been using it to understand more about the disease but also to uh, screen for drugs and to also find out uh, about genes whose pathways impact on batting disease. So perhaps if we um, stop a gene from working, maybe it will rescue the disease. Uh, or maybe if we enhance one of the genes, maybe that will rescue the disease. And of course you can do that very quickly in yeast and importantly, very cheaply as well. So just to give you an example of one um, uh, an example of some of the work that came out of the yeast from a few years ago, um, uh, looking at all the genes that might impact on uh, the disease, uh, the CLN3 disease within yeast, uh, we discovered that there were some central pathways that are really important within cells, uh, including our own cells, uh, that uh, these pathways weren't being triggered. And so the yeast wasn't able to respond to the stresses uh, of its changing environment, which, of course, in, out in the wild, it would need to do all the time. It's out in the wild, it would have these pathways so it could cope with changing moisture or temperature or nutrient availability. But when we looked in more detail, 
we found that there was nothing wrong with these pathways. It was the triggering of the pathways that was at fault. Um, so again, that gives us another clue to the disease. And we also got a, a cover on the front of the journal, which was nice too. So now moving towards uh, therapy, which of course is uh, where my lab's uh, heading uh, for now. So here are the people involved and, our, and also Mariana, a PhD student who's now in, uh, returned to Portugal. And at this point I want to particularly mention uh, other collaborators within UCL, uh, Professor Robin Ali, uh, Sandra Smith, Ahad Rahim and Robin Kettler, uh, because none of this work would be possible without them and we're all bringing our different expertise uh, to bear on this, the challenge of therapy. So uh, well, the way we're thinking about this is that we can either try and compensate for missing functions uh, or supply a working copy of the gene or indeed the protein that the gene encodes. Uh, and we're doing it by thinking about drugs or genes. We know because the disease is very, although the storage occurs in most cells of the body, the disease is really stems from problems with the brain. So we know we're going to have to get that treatment to the brain, which can be a challenge for drugs and also is a, a big challenge for getting genes in there. The eye is a protected environment, so we know we'll have to target the eye separately. And certainly the families tell us that if the children could keep their sight for longer, their quality of life would be better. So uh, that's something that we are particularly keen on doing. And if we do manage to solve all that, we also know we're going to have to target the rest of the body as well because there's going to be problems in the rest of the body. So just to give you um, uh, an example of a couple of things that we've done here, we've been using our yeast to screen for uh, drugs. So we screen for thousands and thousands of drugs uh, using a very robust uh, phenotype. We rescue the, the, see whether the drugs will make the yeast healthy again and stop them dying. Um, and we've identified quite a few uh, compounds that we're interested in. Uh, and we've also found that some of these compounds will actually rescue yeast that have got other diseases as well. So that could make them uh, useful for sort of more than just batten disease. And obviously we will test those in patient cells and in some of our model organisms to see if they work. Uh, in terms of uh, eye gene therapy, um, the, uh, the light goes into the eye and hits the retina at the back of the eye and the re retina is composed of different layers of cells. So uh, we know that often for visual failure it's the photoreceptors that die, these cells at the bottom here. Um, so and if we want to try and ta bring, introduce a gene into the photoreceptors, we have to sort of introduce, uh, use a virus to infect the cells and introduce the gene uh, from underneath. So that's done by uh, going in underneath the retina. But if we need to hit the cells that are um, in the other layers of the retina, then we could have to go from the front of the eye, as it were, from the jelly-like substance at the front of the eye. And we've been doing both, both of these. So here you can see an example of hitting uh, the photoreceptors, and here in the green you can see an example of reaching some of the other cell layers. So this has been really challenging work. Um, that's uh, been doing, is being done by Sophia and Mikkel. And I'll just give you again uh, one example. So this is working on uh, the CLN6 disease uh, using a naturally occurring mouse model with CLN6. And you can see that in this mouse model that the, the photoreceptors, the layers uh, of photoreceptor cells are greatly diminished in a mouse that's, just, that's got the disease. But if we introduce uh, a new CLN6 gene, uh, the human gene, into the mouse eye, we actually prevent the death of uh, these photoreceptor cells. Now, what's been extremely interesting and very unexpected is that if we just put the gene into the photoreceptor cells, it has no effect at all. To prevent the death of the photoreceptor cells, we actually have to hit uh, these cells in the middle layer, and that uh, is a very unusual type of visual failure. Um, it uh, w wasn't really known uh, previously, and so, um, yeah, that tells us there's some interesting biology going on here. And we can also look and see that the uh, function of the eye uh, using electron retinogram is also improved by doing this type of gene therapy. Um, okay, so... 
uh, I've mentioned some of the names of people that I've worked with across UCL and managed to uh, interest many people over the years. Uh, again, you'll recognise some more here. So Paul Gisson is a clinician at GOSH, uh, and he's actually recently been involved in a clinical trial for CLN2 disease, delivering enzyme into the brain uh, of children affected with late infantile, and that's worked incredibly well, and uh, just uh, in the last few days has been announced as a, a new treatment. Um, other people at uh, UCL, you'll recognise Philippa Mills, who helped set, set up one of the enzyme assays, uh, and uh, we've got Glenn, who does uh, pathology, uh, many, many years uh, in diagnostics, and uh, Derek, other enzyme assays, Claire, who's involved in, in uh, routine DNA diagnostics. We've still been identifying genes, and Huel was very much involved in that. Uh, and here's Kevin, working with Kevin at the moment, trying to understand the biology of the disease, looking at the metabolomic differences, and uh, using big omics for that. And uh, Dan has been working with uh, Paul on developing uh, iPS cells, so stem cells, uh, to try again understand more about the disease uh, and also thinking about treatments there. And I've already told you about some of the contributions of some of these other people. So as part of my uh, collaboration, I've been involved in a sort of collaborative approach. I've been involved in quite a number of projects funded by the EU from a very early one, Framework 4. So early, it didn't really have um, uh, a way, you didn't, have, you didn't have to have logos and nice good names then. Um, one of the earlier actions was a concerted action that led to publication of a textbook on Batten disease, uh, again using experts from around the world writing the chapters. And uh, I persuaded Oxford University Press to take that on for the second edition, and we're just planning the third edition now. Uh, this uh, consortium under Framework 6 uh, developed many of the models that we now use, and uh, Demchild uh, was coordinated by Andrea, Andrea Angela Schultz from Germany, and uh, that led to the establishment of um, a disease registry for Batten disease, which is now international and provides all the information that we need to, com to, in it, to be able to monitor, understand the disease and monitor the effects of treatments. So we've got this natural cohort that's there. And now we're in the middle of uh, BACURE here under the Horizon 2020 program, uh, and here we are, we're about halfway through. Uh, and I'm coordinating this, and we're, our aim is to try and develop therapies for CLN3, 6, and 7. So three of the most challenging types of Batten disease, which are caused by mutations in membrane proteins. So I always enjoy working with people who've got expertise in different areas, and, uh, and that includes the Batten Disease Family Association. So Heather Band, who's here, is their scientific officer, and she's actually leading one of the work packages on our, in the, uh, of BACURE in the European uh, grant. And here's a photograph from the uh, family conference uh, where I gave the talk, and the poster from the yeast was drawn. This was last year uh, in commentary. So I need to acknowledge the funding that's been uh, given to uh, fund all this work throughout the years, um, ranging from uh, small donations in the early years uh, from families to uh, more substantial funding from some of the different family organisations that have particularly allowed uh, either uh, some pilot studies or even funded PhD students. Uh, and of course, right up to uh, huge amounts of, amounts of money, such as that from the European Union, which uh, funded six million euros for back cure. Obviously, Brexit will have an impact on that, but uh, hopefully we'll still be able to um, collaborate and work as part of consortia in the future. So, as I was uh, reflecting, or as I was preparing this talk, I was uh, doing a little bit of reflections along the way and uh, realised I actually grew up in a very female environment. So this is my nuclear family, uh, myself and two sisters, my parents, and we just had uh, my grandma, we only had one grandparent alive. So uh, my father, I have to say, was very pleased when three grandsons came along. I went to a grammar school, which was an all-girls school. The boys' school was across the road, but I had my education uh, in the girls' school, and the college that I went to at Cambridge was also a female college. So I spent a lot of time in the company of women. Um, 
not a surprise, perhaps, therefore, that the kind of work, uh, the sort of citizenship I've got involved in at UCL has been around uh, uh, equality, diversity and inclusion, particularly through Athena Swan and more recently through uh, Women in Leadership. So I'll just spend a moment talking about some of that. So this photograph here is my final year photograph. Uh, this is the faculty. There are three women, uh, just less than 30% female faculty. Here are the undergraduate students, 30% uh, female. At the time, we thought that was perfectly normal. Of course, women don't do science, or at least not as many women do science as men. Nowadays, we know that anyone studying to do bio, uh, biological science or biomedical science that is at least 50% uh, female, if not 60%. Um, so things have changed. At uh, the LMCB, we uh, began to engage with uh, the Athena programme, which was uh, particularly set up in 2005, so quite a while ago now, which was looking at gender equality within, first of all, within uh, science, uh, academic science, uh, but has now moved on to think about gender equality across any subject, uh, wherever there's an imbalance, it doesn't matter which way. And uh, so within the LMCB, I've been working with uh, Rob de Bruin, and we've been thinking, addressing this uh, over the years, and you've already heard that we have gone through two silver awards and got the first UCL uh, gold award. And here's our uh, committee at the moment, um, which is now broadened and we're looking at all the protected characteristics under the Equality Act because what we want is for to have really best practice, good practice uh, within the LMCB because that way we do the best science because we're using all the talent that's there and we're drawing and encouraging all the talent that's out there to come in and contribute to our science. And then last year I was involved in the UCL Women in Leadership programme uh, which, gave, which was, uh, I really enjoyed uh, the whole programme. It was over a, a number of months. Uh, it gave me time to reflect, uh, to, to learn that there were different styles of leadership uh, and that all had uh, different, uh, were valid in the ways to contribute. Um, and we came out of that, uh, we've, we've carried on meeting as a cohort and wanting to, to continue to provide leadership, but doing it uh, the way that uh, is natural uh, uh, for us, which of course, and everyone is slightly different. And uh, I'm really pleased that Jenny Morgan has agreed to uh, give the vote of thanks because Jenny was in my coaching group and we got to know each other um, there. So uh, if we're going to do the best, uh, if you're going to be able to do the best work, you've got to think about uh, the rest of your life. We are body, mind and spirit after all, and we need to be able to... Um, uh, make sure that uh, we can do our work by looking after the rest of our lives. So here's a glimpse into at least some of the rest of my life. So here I am, this is me in my PhD robes and my husband Michael uh, in his uh, graduation robes and uh, we're holding my thesis there. Uh, here we are now. I think I've caused him more grief than he's caused me, what do you reckon? <laughs> We have two children, uh, Alice and Matthew, who, who are both here. Uh, they both came to UCL Nursery. Um, uh, we, I commuted in on the train uh, with them in a pushchair. Fortunately, only ever one child at a time. The age gap just worked for that. Uh, but it did mean that for about eight years, all my work was constrained by UCL Nursery hours, and, uh, which, of course, also meant it was a challenge if I went away at a conference because I lost my childcare. Um, Alice is now uh, oops, at university, uh, reading sociology, and Matthew's doing his GCSEs. Um, so, I've uh, almost reached the end. I want to say uh, thank you, first of all, uh, to my parents, who allowed me to follow my own interests, um, to my sisters, uh, Rebecca and Catherine, who've always provided love and support, particularly during recent challenging times, to Michael, who's uh, been there throughout my scientific career. This promotion is shared with you. And then to my children, who've provided such joy and delight to me, and I hope that you too can find um, your place where you can be yourselves in the world. Okay, and then I'll close by saying thank you all for listening.
particularly thank you for those who've made considerable effort to be here as well, family and also previous people uh, in my lab. Thank you. In this oh, oh, for my. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah, for such a wonderful, inspirational talk. Um, so, I've been thinking, like Sarah's commented on, and what um, influences in her early life led her to this academic and um, scientific career and her leadership role, particularly in Athena Swan here at UCL. Well, as she mentioned, um, she's the eldest of three sisters, and her sisters Rebecca and Catherine are both here today. And although she's the eldest, um, she in fact ended up being the smallest. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, she, um, the, the family enjoyed playing board games, but despite having two younger sisters, apparently Sarah always liked to win. Um, and for her scientific career, she mentioned her father had a de degree in metallurgy, and apparently he, he enjoyed doing experiments when he was a boy. Um, she's, uh, she was, as a child, a fan of Doctor Who and the Tomorrow People, probably also um, influencing her choice of scientific career. Um, and one, um, one of my spies has told me that um, once when um, Sarah's dad was giving her a driving lesson with both of her sisters in the back of the car, she missed the turning and ended up in driving into somebody's front garden. Uh, but nevertheless, she still managed to pass her driving test um, first time. Um, so having um, grown up in a family of, of, of three sisters, um, she went to grammar school. Um, I think this is... Sarah here, a girls' grammar school, and she's still in touch with many of her school friends um, almost 30 years later, which I think says a lot about her as a person. She then went on uh, to a women's only college um, in Cambridge, and now she's at UCL, and UCL was the first university to admit um, men and women um, equally. So I think there's a trend here, um, that her early start with lots of women surrounding her, and now her leadership role, um, women in leadership, um, and also Athena Swan. Um, and this is one um, sign, um, an early sign of her, um, th th that she was going to be a leading academic. Here she is whilst at university, standing outside a door with her name, Dr. Mole, on it. <laughs> so as um, Sarah's mentioned, um, it's a family is very important to her. And despite all her hard work, I'm just amazed that she seems to be able to lead such a good work-life balance. Um, so she's been married to her husband, Michael, for many, many years now. I think they met when they were teenagers. Um, and here's the family. They enjoy walking holidays. And here she is with, with Michael and with Alice and Matthew on, a walking holiday, on several of their walking holidays. And I think the hat that she's wearing is actually says UCL on it. So one of the really um, interesting and important things about Sarah is her total commitment to equality, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and she co-led um, with um, um, Rob de Bruin um, the LMCB's Athena Swan Committee. And they were the first um, in UCL, the first department in UCL, to achieve a gold Athena Swan Award, which they received last October. And she was invited to present on the pathway to gold at the Athena Swan Award Ceremonies. And she invited Rob to co-present with her. And this really indicates, um, as Rob said, her, her, her commitment to simply good practice and to gender equality. And there are not many people, and certainly not many men, that would have invited somebody else to join in the, in the limelight. So... Sarah also has um, outstanding leadership skills. And as she mentioned, we both attended the UCL Women in Leadership course last year. Um, and I think several people in the audience that attended that course are here um, to support her today. And these are a couple of comments that re from um, uh, members of that course that really um, describe the sort of leader that she is. She stood out um, as a natural leader. She's calm, kind, and inspiring. And we really all expect her to do great things and contribute even more to UCL. So she's mentioned several of the colleagues um, that, um, that have um, worked with her along the way. And these are some of the comments from her colleagues about her. And I think the last one really sums it all up, um, the person that she is. Also, other colleagues um, have commented on her single-handed drive to get Batten's disease on the map. 
and somebody mentioned her as being an unsung hero and also an ultimate professional with an amazing eye to detail. So here are some of the things that some of you may not know about Professor Mole. First of all, she can sing. I think is this, this is here, here in the primary school choir. She can also dance. And here she is with Michael um, uh, at Imperial. I think they're doing, uh, doing the jive here. And she, she's also got an amazing cookery skills. And apparently her Ma Mexican seven-layer dip was her signature dish on many work, at many work social events. She also, she mentioned, enjoys doing jigsaw puzzles. And this was a jigsaw puzzle, a 4,000-piece jigsaw puzzle that she managed to do whilst recovering from surgery. So one of the things I hadn't realized until recently about Sarah is that she was diagnosed with breast cancer and underwent treatment. And despite all of this, she still managed to achieve remarkable things both academically and in her leadership role with her Athena Swan application. So I think this is an inspiration to all of us, and particularly those of us um, who may um, be diagnosed with, um, with, with, with um, serious illnesses during our working lives. So when um, I was chatting to Sarah last week about her inaugural lecture, I asked her what she was going to wear. And she pointed out that if we were two men, we would not have been discussing this. <laughs> a, 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 a man, men in a leadership position, all they have to do is find a suit from the back of their wardrobe, put on a shirt and tie and polish their shoes. So but women in leadership really have to think exactly, very carefully about what they're going to wear. And these are two contrasting styles here. Um, um, I don't need to say who these two are, but perhaps Sarah and I are probably more like um, uh, Hillary Clinton. We like wearing trousers and we like being comfortable but still smart. So really it remains for me to, um, uh, to ask you all to join me in congratulating Sarah on her professorship and all her amazing achievements so far at UCL. And I really look forward, as I'm sure all of you do, as to what she's going to be doing next um, and what she's going to achieve for UCL. So let's join me in, in, in applause to thank her very much and to congratulate her. So before we go and have a lovely cup of tea, um, I'd like to invite Heather Band from the Batten Disease Family Association to come up because I think she wants to present um, something to Sarah. We're now going to break for tea, and those who are coming back to hear the second of the inaugural lectures will be back in here at 4.30. Thank you.